Thank you. So I have a security blanket here today. Some notes. You know, I tell people that um, my perception of people when they speak is they got everything in their head. And then they go down through it and they speak. And it's not the way it is for me. It's kind of more of a stream of consciousness sort of thing. And sometimes the stream dries up. So that's why we've got the notes here. I've got this friend who comes at church and he's after church and be in the coffee hour and I say, What do you have for me today? <laughs> and he has no idea I got nothing. So I say, I got nothing. So, you know, he'll he'll then try to say something and then it'll go from there. So anyhow, just so I cover everything I want to cover, hopefully we won't need this. But uh, Deacon Matt, he left, well, let's put it this way, from the baby boomers on down. Because I've been asked to talk a little bit about college students and you know, how they think today. And this generation of college students is so different from every other generation that, I've, that I encountered. It's like, it's like they came from a different planet. And all of a sudden, they were just put down there. And there they were. And it totally took me by surprise. But looking back on it, I can see that everybody from the baby boomers on down, the baby boomers, which is my generation, the worst of all generations in America, they came and they, you know, they sought to change America from what had been basically a Protestant Christian country to a more secular country. My take on it was that, that they had been schooled in kind of the form of the Enlightenment, you know, religion is, is the root of all evil and man's reasoning alone can, can enlighten us. It's been an abject failure, by the way. Your average college student, when they walk down off that stage with their diploma, has no doesn't even have any idea why they exist. So it's been pretty much an abject failure. But so they, they, they started this kind of secularism where they're pushing the secularism. And each generation from them down was secular to one degree or another, but it was just an idea. You know, they had the idea, they would debate the idea, you could debate the idea with them, they were open, many of them, maybe to change or whatever. You got this generation who comes now, and there it's secular. Secular for them is not an idea. Secular for them is who they are. When you when you say something to them, when I, when I kind of preach to them, just you know, basic Christianity or whatever, to them it is so foreign to them that they can't imagine that they have no second. They, they have no Christian remembrance. They they don't know anything about Christianity at all. Most of them, when they challenge Christianity. This is the way it works. They all tell me, well, I read the whole Bible all the way through, you know? And then they gave me the same five scriptures from the Old Testament that I know they got from an atheist website, you know? And they say, oh, no, no, I didn't get it. No, no, I've never been to an atheist website, you know? And I say, well, how come you guys, it's a pretty big book, you know? How can you guys read this whole book and come up with the same five scriptures, you know, to, to, to discredit Christianity? They have no idea the difference between the Old and the New Testaments. They, they, they just, they just, it's gone. They don't, they, they, it has been erased from their mind. So one of the things I think happened was, well, for me, this is how I got caught off guard. When Deacon Matt was there, there was an atheist group on campus that actually got a room in the spiritual center somehow. Nobody quite knows how that happened. <laughs> but there was an atheist group there. And these guys, they, they were out. Where, where I speak, it's, it's, it's a building that kind of the side that I'm on kind of faces, it comes down the mall at Penn State, which is, which is kind of patterned after the mall in DC. I got that by spying on the lion ambassadors that walk by, listening to them. But, and so right behind it, there's a, there's a sidewalk that, that's very busy. Everybody's got a class here. There's, there's steps that go up. There's landings that go up. People sit there, they, they hang out there, whatever. So these atheists, there was, there was a gaggle of them. They would come out every day. Some of them never finished class. I mean, they never went to class. They ended up dropping out. They were just there every single day. So there was this changeover. And while the changeover was happening, we were so busy with these atheists. And Deacon Matt was out there a lot. We were so busy with these atheists that I didn't even notice it. And about the time Deacon Matt left, maybe 2009 or so, uh, you know, they all kind of left. Some of them dropped out. Some of them graduated. Um, it was kind of funny because when they got tired of finally of hanging out at Willard and debating, they went and played Dungeons and Dragons. You know, <laughs> even you guys can't stay away from some sort of spirituality. So they all kind of left, and um, 
then I'm left with this, with this chest. So I just start preaching as I normally would. And all of a sudden, I realize, you know, I'm not really connecting here. Something's wrong here. Something's not. Something's weird here. And it went on with a bit of a slow study. So it went on for a couple of years before I finally said, you know, maybe I'm getting old here. You know, maybe I'm just, I don't got it anymore. Maybe I'm not connecting anymore. And that's when I said, well, I better, maybe there's something different. And I began to study them a little bit to see where they were coming from. And this is kind of what I think happened. My generation, we, again, not the brightest generation in the world. We, we were basically a bunch of potheads. But when they wanted to change this from secular to, or, or somewhat basically Protestant to, to, to secular, they were smart about this. Because what they did is, about the time, you know, 1960s, early 1970s, America's kind of being opened up to other world religions in a way she hadn't been opened up before. You know, the Beatles are going to India, sitting under gurus. These yogis are from Transcendental Meditation are on Merv Griffin. And the baby boomers kind of said, well, look, these guys are equally as religious as you are. They're, they're equally as holy as you are, or whatever. Um, how do you know that your religion's the right religion? How do you know your God is the right God? And that kind of, that kind of began to infiltrate. And, and, and you know, again, a little bit, each generation got a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. This generation believes you cannot know who God is. That's, no, they don't believe it. In their mind, they know it. It's axiomatic. It's, again, it's who they are. It's a very important thing to understand about this generation. It's who they are. They, they, can't, they can't think about thinking in a different way. So, um, so I think you can't know who God is. So sometimes people ask me, why don't you go out and you know, just tell them all about Christianity? And I do that a little bit. I, I, you know, I try and tell them about Christianity, but it's irrelevant to them. It's like, it's like some, some guy came up to me the other day, a Muslim came up to me the other day, and he showed me a verse for, from the Koran to prove his point. I said, what's that have to do with me? You know, it's not, I don't believe your book, you know, so what's that have to do with me? And, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like that with them. If you just tell them about Christianity, they're going to say, what's that have to do with me? They'll be polite, nice kids, but it's like, so what? You know, that doesn't affect me at all, because I don't believe you can know uh, that that's true. So here's the interesting thing. They are, I think, the most conformed generation since the 1950s. Now, I understand the 1950s. They were conformed. They knew they were conformed. They liked conforming. If you, know, you weren't conforming, you were a nonconformist, and you liked nonconforming, this generation is different. This generation, they're absolutely conformed in their thinking. And they're absolutely convinced they think for themselves. And, and I saw that, and I'm scratching my head, and I'm thinking, how does this happen? How, how do you come on a campus that's this? And it's not just Penn State. I called a friend of mine the other day, who, who, the guy who used to preach out at Willard. He's, he's out preaching across the country. And I said, I'm, I'm going to give this talk, and I, I want to know, is this just Penn State, or do you find this everywhere? He says, no, no, we, we find this everywhere. So they're absolutely conformed. They, they firmly believe they think for themselves. So, I'm, so again, I'm thinking, how does this happen? This is like, you know, this is practically miraculous. How, how, how do you get this? So this is my take on how it happened. Nobody sat, sat them down. Well, before we do that, this is the whole stream of consciousness. Before we do that, I want to go down through the list of beliefs. And, and I'll tell them. I'll say, look, I can, I can tell you guys what you think about certain things. I don't have to talk to you. I, don't have to, I can just tell you what you think. And I'm like, nah, you can't do that. No way. You can't do that. So I go down through this list of beliefs. And I ask them, well, how, you know, I'll go down through this list of beliefs. You tell me how many I get wrong. And occasionally, in very rare occasions, somebody will, will, will disagree with one of them. But, and, and the first three, you'll see, have no defense to them at all. But they don't care. It doesn't matter to this generation that they have no defense for them. The first one always is you can't know who God is. And everything kind of comes down from there. Second one's related to that. You can't know what the right religion is. The third one is fairly related to that. You can't know what happens after death and how to prepare. So those first three obviously have no defense to them at all. 
you can't even come up with a single argument to defend them. Nobody, nobody there even tries. Their morals, they'll believe you shouldn't rape, murder, pillage, and destroy, but they can't defend it. I, I, I take the worst of all positions out there and challenge them, and they, can't, they just can't defend it. Um, after that, they'll be pro-choice on virtually everything. And they'll definitely be pro-choice on homosexuality, premarital sex, drunkenness, abortion, and these days, transgenderism. If they're not quite there in transgenderism yet, they will be soon. Um, they, they're absolutely, well, this might be, I don't know. This is, this is my belief, all right? And I put it out there, and I think it's, I think it's true, and I challenge them on it. The belief, they will believe in the concept of race, which I don't think that there's a single evidence for that. And I tell them, look, why does skin color make you of a different race? Why not eye color? Why not hair color? You know, why skin color make you of a different race? So this is what they do at Penn State. They say, well, if you're of a different skin color, you're of a different race, and you really can't understand a person of another race. Now, let's all get along. And I'm like, how are you supposed to do that? You've already divided them totally. They can't understand each other. Now you tell them to get along. Um, so after that, well, they'll, they'll believe in relatively easy divorce, especially, you know, kind of like before pre-1970 when you had to have maybe adultery or abuse to get divorced. They, um, their minds have been formed to believe the consensus of the scientists no matter what. If there's a consensus of the scientists, it's just true. And you cannot, you, you know, you can't talk them out of it. And therefore, they believe that they'll believe in the scientific creation myth of Big Bang, abiogenesis, and evolution. So I'll go down through every one of those, and they'll believe every single one of them. And yet, they're fir firmly convinced that they think for themselves. So again, I'm, uh, you know, it didn't make sense to me for a long time, but I think what happened was this. Nobody actually sits them down and says, A, B, C, D, this is what you're gonna, this is what you're gonna think, this is what you're gonna believe. They absorb it from the culture. And there's never been a time when the culture has more ways of getting inside our head than it does today. They'll be walking down, the, they, they can't even put down their electronic device when they walk down the sidewalk. They'll have it plugged into their ears. They'll have, they'll have a phone in front of their eyes like this. I saw a guy walk into a construction site, and he didn't even know he walked into a construction site. He was just walking in, and he didn't know until he almost ran into the fence on the other side of the construction site that he was in a construction site. And so they're on these things all day long, and they're absorbing the stuff, the, the, basically the culture. They're not, they're not on these devices trying to figure out why they exist. They're just absorbing the culture all day long. Um, and then, you know, you add on to that. And then, of course, you've got social media where, where, they, where they know what everybody else thinks. And that's when I really started to see this conformity of thought at the advent of social media and the smartphone. Because then they had it with them all the time. And they, and they knew what everybody else was thinking. And, you know, it just gets into them popular music, popular radio, popular TV, educational system. It's all secularism all the time. And they just absorb it. They don't think about it. You know, if, you, if I would have asked them what they believe, they, they couldn't have come up with that list. They don't think about it. They absorb it. It, it gets into them. It becomes who they are. And what you see with this is... When they're, this is my take on it, when they're on these phones all day long, most of the time they're just being entertained, right? They're just on there, they're, they're doing whatever. I don't, even, I don't even know nor care what they do, but they're on there um, just being entertained. And, you know, I try to tell them, look, nothing wrong with being entertained once in a while. You know, most people, you know, hard days work, they go home, maybe they eat dinner, maybe they watch TV or something for an hour or two or whatever, just to unwind and get ready for the next day. You know, life's not a barrel of laughs, right? It's kind of a little drudgery sometimes, and so people need to be entertained and whatever. And, but it's always an escape. So I try to tell them, look, if you're on these things all day long, and you're being entertained all day long, what are you escaping from? You know, and they just, 
You always get the deer in headlight look from them. They always look at you like, oh. So, you know, I say, look, if you're on these things all the day long, you're escaping from life. There's something about life that you're not dealing with very well, and you're escaping from it. And I try to tell them that a secular society is always a meaningless one. It's always meaningless. It's always purposeless. You know, it was the old Shakespeare quote, um, uh, so much sound and fury signifying nothing. So I tell them, it's like, it's like the Wizard of Oz, right? So Dorothy and, and her buddies are walking down that long hallway, and there's this big face and all the explosions and everything. And they're all trembling in the boots, in their boots, and they got the, the broom and everything. And, you know, they're saying, hey, you know, we did what you said. And then the dog goes and pulls back the curtain. And there's just a guy back there manipulating lovers. That's a secular society. There's nothing to it. It's meaningless. It's purposeless. And they know it. And, well, they don't know it. They just, they, they sense it. And so I think, again, I think what happens is this. We're not meant to live meaningless, purposeless lives. So they begin to feel uneasy. Something's not right. Something's wrong. And you can tell when you talk to them, they know something's, something's not right. But that's very uncomfortable to have that feeling. And what they realize, they don't think they realize it, but what happens after a while is they know that when they get on that machine, that device, they feel better. Right? And it makes that uneasy feeling go away. And so, and again, if you ask them this, they would have no idea, but this, so this is, you know, but I think this is what happens. So the more they're on it, the more they feel good, you know? And so after a while, they're on it all the time, and it's like a drug, and it makes them feel good. It makes that uneasy feeling that something isn't right here just go away, and they feel better. So, um, this is how it works a lot of times. This is kind of pivoting. This is, this is how, how things work a lot of times. They'll ask me, they'll say, well, how are you so sure? And I grew up, I grew up in a secular home. Um, I never remember religion being discussed at all in our, in our um, household. Um, had no idea if there was a God or not. Went on a prolonged <laughs> search in between much drug use and finally, you know, um, found God or whatever. So I so said, how do you know? How are you so sure who the God is and what the right religion is? And I'll say to them, well, can you think of any possible way that I could be sure? And almost every time, almost every time, with very few exceptions, they'll say, nope, can't think of a single way you could know. And I'll say to them, you know, the answer is really quite simple. It's really simple enough that a young child could come up with it, but your average college student cannot. And when I, well, yeah. And when I tell it to them, I say, when I tell it to you, you'll see this. And it's not that the young child's smarter than the average college student, it's just that they're educated to think, in this, despite all of their claims to the contrary, they're, they're educated to think in an extremely narrow way. And they can't get out of that. They could, but they just don't get out of that. They just stay there, and they can't think outside of that little narrow thing. So I say, well, God can make himself known, right? So they say, and as soon as I say that, they'll kind of nod their head and say, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, that was simple. You got me. Um, that would be a way, but God doesn't do that, right? So I say, how do you know that? And that's when you get the deer in the headlight look. They just look at you like, and, and, and I was chastising this, them a little bit today. I was saying, look, your generation doesn't ask questions, right? When somebody tells you you can't know who God is, doesn't the question, how do you know that, just present itself? Isn't it just there for you? And for them, they just, again, they just look at you like, because it's not. It's not there for them. They, they'll, they'll, they'll question religion all day long. But to question these beliefs of the culture, they just, to them, it's just, they don't do it. So whatever the dominant media and the dominant educational establishment tells them, that's what they're going to believe. Doesn't matter what it is. You know, we saw it a couple years ago with transgenderism, right? Before Bruce Jenner, um, even at Penn State, you know, transgenderism was under the radar. I mean, it was there, it's been there. 
It was kind of funny, many years ago, the transgendered want, en wanted entrance into the homosexual group. And at the time, they were too weird for the homosexuals, you know. And so you know that if you're out there and the homosexuals don't want you, then, you know, you're out there. But finally, the homosexuals could not justify that anymore, so they let them in. But it was still always under the radar. And then you got Bruce Jenner becoming Caitlyn Jenner. Not really, but sort of becoming Caitlyn Jenner. And boom, it changed like that, right? I'm watching, I'm watching you know, Fox News, and the conservative anchors are like, yeah, if that's what he wants. That's, 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 you know, that's great, whatever he wants. You know? So I met a couple of transgendered. It was funny, the first one I met, just a few, last week maybe, I'm talking to them, we're talking something, I don't know. A lot of times students like to be Buddhist because they, they have no idea what it is, but it sounds cool. So <laughs> they're like, so I'm a Buddhist. And I'm like, so I finally, after a while, I said, you know, and you know, she didn't look bad. You know, I'm saying, you know, you look like a girl. You're good, but you talk like a guy. I think there was an old, there's an old song like that. In the <laughs> you talk like a guy, you know, so what is it? Like, oh, so what are, what, which one are you? And she's, um, she just kind of, he, it was a he. And I was just like, uh. So we got into this long discussion, and it came down to this. My contention was you've got to base things in reality. You can't just go by feelings and thoughts because they can get messed up. So if you're an XX, you're a girl. If you're an XY, you're a guy. That's the reality of the situation. And if your thoughts and your feelings don't measure up to that, well, you better get busy because they should. You know? so, so start making them uh, 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 conform to reality. And he was like, oh, no, 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 that doesn't matter. It's how I feel. It's what I think. You know, so once you get into that, once you get into the, the only thing that matters is how I feel or what I think, you can go anywhere. But there's nothing, there's nothing grounding you anymore. Um, so I tell them, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody. Um, if it does, I apologize in advance. But I tell them, look, if the culture today began to tell you that bestiality was okay, within Practically moments, you'd be pro-choice on bestiality. And they're like, no way, no way, no way. And they just laugh at it. So I said, OK, this is how they're going to do it. And you tell me. You, you, you argue with me about it. And they say, all right. You know, they're, they're, they're always all ready to argue. So they say, um, you believe in evolution. You believe you're just an evolved animal. You believe that all you are is an animal. So. Anytime you have sex with a human, you're having sex with an animal. So why are you so bigoted? Why are you so speciocentric? Why are you such a speciophobe, a speciest, that's so narrow-minded that you won't go past, you're, you're basically an animal racist. You, know? you won't go past your own species. And then you hate people who want to. And I said, what possible argument could you have against that? And the only argument I ever hear is this. They say, well, animals can't give consent. And I say, look, most animals don't ask for consent. So, you know, <laughs> find an animal that doesn't ask for consent, and, you know, you're fine. And then that's all they got. They're done. They can't. They are, they are totally open, totally open to being manipulated by whatever the dominant media and the dominant educational establishment is telling them. As long as they're telling them that, they're going to go with it. It doesn't matter what it is. So this is what they'll tell me. They'll say, well, you can't know who God is, but we know God loves us. So, so I say, look, I say, you know, it never ceases to amaze me how you guys string these thoughts together. <laughs> if you can't know who God is, how do you know that he loves you? Maybe he doesn't like you at all. How do you know? <laughs> how are you supposed to know? But that's not, that's not the, the worst contradiction. The worst, or, or the, or the the one that, that, that's more important, is that love is a relational word. When you love somebody, you desire a relationship with them. So as soon as you say God loves us, you are by default saying he desires relationship with us, if you're going to use that word. And then you're turning around and saying, we can't know who he is. Well, the only reason we can't know who he is is because he doesn't want to be known. But he loves us, which means he wants relationship with us. It's totally contradictory, but again, 
it, it's like, it's like when, 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 when you tell them these things, they look at you, they'll even agree with you, and then they'll walk away believing whatever they believed a minute ago because it's who they are. It's what they are. Um, so the way their thinking goes is this. Since you can't know who God is, then God can't really hold you accountable for what you do because it's his fault that you can't know who he is. Um, and so as long as you don't rape, murder, pillage, and destroy, you're okay because everybody should know those are wrong. But again, if you challenged them on it, they couldn't defend it. But everybody should know that those are wrong. So as long as you don't do those things, when you stand before God, he will forgive you because you couldn't know. So they all think they're safe. They all think that, that everything's going to be okay in the end, that because God loves them, everything's going to be all right. You know, so I'll tell them. And, and I... I some people, sometimes people get angry at me for this, but I do it just to kind of jab them a little bit. I'll just, in general, say, you're going to hell. Just, you're headed to hell, just in general, right? And, and, and I rarely do that to an individual unless he forces me to, you know? If some guy comes up and he says, well, I'm drunk, with, I'm drunk every weekend, and I screw my girlfriend every night. Am I going to hell? Well, yeah, you know, that's where you're headed. You know, I can't soft soap it for you. You better turn around. But I just do it in general, just to, see, just to see what they will do. And a lot of times they get upset. And I said, well, how do you know you're not going to hell? You know, what's so special about you? Well, well, you know, God will forgive me. You don't even know who God is. You know, how do you know he's going to forgive you? Again, maybe he doesn't like you. Maybe he doesn't want to forgive you. You know, maybe whatever. How, how, do you, how are you so sure he's going to forgive you? Well, it goes back to this. If you can't know who he is, then, you know, he's ultimately has to forgive you because he's kept that knowledge from you, All right? So they're in a very dangerous position. So another thing I try to tell them is that the culture is, is a river, and it's flowing swiftly into hell. And if you just jump into that culture and tread water, it's just going to take you there. You're just going to flow naturally in that direction. Because a secular culture has absolutely no incentive to point you towards God. They have no incentive to give you any positive um, feedback towards God at all. Because if they begin to tell you, hey, maybe you can know who God is hey, maybe you can know what the right religion is, and people you know, start to wake up a little bit, and they start to seek God, and they start to find God, well, it's not going to be a secular culture anymore. So they have absolutely no incentive to push you in that direction. They have every incentive, but they're, but they're smart about it in that they don't come out and just tell you these things. It's just ingrained in everything they do. So, like, for instance, many movies today, have the obligatory sex scene in them, right? And it's almost always unmarried uh, couple. It's almost always uh, put in a, in, in a neutral or positive light. And it's virtually never germane to the plot, right? You don't walk out of that movie. If they took that sex scene in, you wouldn't be walking out of that movie saying, man, Mabel, I just didn't understand that plot. You know, <laughs> there, was, there was something missing in that plot. And then you think, oh, yeah, that's it. If they just had a sex scene, that would have brought everything together. <laughs> right? It never works that way. But it's there. And when it's there, they're preaching to you. They're telling you this is OK. But you're just there entertained. You know? you, you're just absorbing it. You're entertained. It's, it's, it, you're not on your guard. When I'm out there speaking to them, they're all on their guard because they know somebody's out there trying to convince them of something. But when they're just being entertained with their music or their movies or their TV or whatever, I notice the same thing with homosexuality because um, I notice that, this is my kind of take on it, but I noticed that in, uh, when they were first starting to push homosexuality, most, uh, whatever you want to call it, most of the homosexuals that you saw on TV or whatever, you'd see in a comedic light. 
right? They were kind of making fun of themselves, stereotyping themselves. It wasn't, it wasn't the sort of, I'm going to make fun of you because, you know, you're a horrible, terrible thing, and I'm going to make fun of you. It was just make fun of, make light, you know, make fun, have some fun. And that began, but again, when you're looking at that, you're thinking, oh, that's funny, they're fun. And, and, and it begins to lower your resistance. And I've noticed that now, when homosexuality is presented on TV, it's presented a lot of times in a more serious light in the sense that the characters are serious characters and that the, the, the other characters that are for their homosexuality are the good guys in the show. And anybody that's against it comes off like this hateful, bigoted, you know, whatever. And so since you're just being there entertained and you want to associate with the good people, not with the bad people. So again, your guard is down and, you're just, and, and, and you just find yourself associating with the, the, the good people that are for the homosexuality that, that, that say that there's nothing wrong with it. So I try to show, show the name popular music. It's the same thing. God is very, uh, very often not mentioned. If he is mentioned or if there's a religious figure, they're not you know, put in a very good light oftentimes. If you have you know, touched by an angel, well, that could be any religion under the sun. It really doesn't matter. Um, so, you know, as long as you have the spiritual experience. So when they asked me then, well, how do I find out? How do I know? You know, I usually tell them, look, what most people do is this. What most people do is follow their parents' religion, and that's it. Just mindlessly follow their parents' religion. And, I'm so, and, and you know, you have to ask the question: How do you know your parents got it right? You know, you can't just mindlessly follow your parents' religion. What other people do, I think, is they seek for a spiritual experience to justify their religion. And I try to tell them there's plenty of spirits out there that will justify anything you want as long as it's not the truth. And some people just seek for a spiritual experience, and they have the same problem. What very few people do, seemingly these days, at least in this generation, is seek for God only wanting to know truth. And it doesn't matter where that gets you. It doesn't matter if it gets you killed in some societies. It doesn't matter if it gets you thrown out of your family. All you care about is truth. Very few people seek God. And so I try to tell them, if you will seek God, if you'll seek God under those premises, all you want to know is truth. If you do get deceived for a while, which is possible, Deception always looks good. It's always very enticing. Stretches as far as the eye can see, but it's not very deep. If you're always seeking for truth, if you're always digging for truth, and that's all you want is truth, that if you get deceived for a while, it, it will appear to you as deception um, eventually. So ultimately, I tell them this. If you go ahead and live your life any way you want, but in the meantime, get up every morning, and however many times during the day, and purpose to do this every single day, however many times during the day um, you want to do it, with all the heart that you can, with all the seriousness that you can, ask God to some way make himself known to you in a way that you can't deny. Make it so clear to you that you can't deny it. And I said, if you'll do that every day for the rest of your life, one of two things has to happen. Right? Either you get to the end of your life and God doesn't show up. But then, of course, you've still lived your life the way you would have anyhow. Or at some point, God opens up your eyes. God takes the scales off your eyes and you can see. And I try to say, look, if you really, because this is what I tell them anyhow. And again, you guys know a lot more about this than I do, but this is just my take on it. We all have these two competing desires within us. On the one hand, we all want God to some degree. Even atheists will tell me you know, that, 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 they want, that they want God. I don't believe them a lot of times, but they'll tell me that. And, but we also want to be our own God, do our own thing, go our own way, have our own, have our own beliefs, morals, whatever we want. We want to be our own God. And normally when we first start seeking after God, the desire to be our own God is up here, and the desire for God is down here. And I said, because God loves us, he won't play the tyrant over us. So the seeking process begins to turn that. 
And, and depending on how big that gap is, it can take a long time or a short time, but that has to be overturned because otherwise God has to play the tyrant over us and he won't do that. But when we get to the place where he can, he can open up our eyes without playing the tyrant, then he will do that. So one or two more things before, before you know, stop here. But it's an epidemic belief their, their basic belief, other than, you know, you can't know who God is, is I'm a good person. So I tell them sometimes, again, just to jab them a little bit, if there's one thing you can be assured of in this life, it's that you're not a good person. <laughs> That's, there's nothing much more assured than that. I had an atheist one time, and, and, and atheists are, are funny. They'll, they'll stay out there in the middle of January. It's like 10 degrees out. We could walk in the building, but they don't want to walk in the building. They want to stand outside and debate whether there's a God or not for hours. Hours and hours. And they'll come back. They want to talk about God more than most believers want to talk about God. All right? And my take on things these days is we're all a little wimpier than we used to be. And atheists are a little wimpier than they used to be. They don't come right out and say there is no God. They think they've gotten past that. They just say, well, I don't see any evidence for God. And that's what the whole debate ends up being. You know, I showed them evidence, they, they try to knock it down. Um, so I was doing this with this one atheist, and he's cut it, he, he, this didn't go on for hours and hours and hours, as it often does. He just cuts it short. And he says, well, even if there is a God, I'm going to heaven. So I think, I think this is interesting. The atheist is going to heaven. So I say, well, why do you say that? And he says, and I should have known. I should have known. He said, because I'm a good person. And I said, okay, well, that's interesting. You're a good person. Have you ever done anything wrong? He says, well, well sure, of course. You know, but everybody does wrong. Well, do you think you might do wrong in the future? Well, of course, yeah. If I, then you're not a good person. Because good does good. Good thinks good thoughts, has good intentions, has good motivations. Good is simply good. And you're not that. So you're not, now, I try to tell them, look, I'm sure you're plenty good enough to walk around free in American society. That bar is not exactly high, right? <laughs> Anybody, it's tough not to get over that bar. But you're saying you're good enough to get into heaven, right? That bar is a bit higher. Everybody in there is all good all the time. So if you're saying you're good enough for that, then, you know, I, you know and they'll say, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm not, I'm not that good, but God will forgive me. And then we go through the whole, how do you know that sort of thing. That, that, that's, uh, we'll just give that to you. We'll give that to you. We'll just say, you get to heaven and God says, you're in the top 50%. I'll forgive you. Come on in. Right. I said, but so what? How's that going to help you? I said, if God came out here right now and just told all of us, you're forgiven. Assuming this level of goodness, how long is it going to take you to sin again? For your average college, well, maybe not just your average college, your very next thought, almost, for many of them, it's just going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be out there somewhere, right? So I said, you're going to sin again. So is that what heaven is? You just get forgiven, and you sin, and you get forgiven, and you sin, and you get forgiven, and you sin. Um, there's got to be something more than it. Yeah, you need forgiven, but that's not good enough. So then they, so that I tried, what I try and tell them is, look, you look out at humanity, if, if it was 80% of the people in the world sinned and 20% didn't, maybe we could chalk sin up to solely and only being a choice. But when everybody sins, maybe there's something more involved. Not that it's not a choice, but maybe there's something more involved. And there's got to be some sort of glitch in human nature that draws us to that. And then I tell them, you know, the fall of man and all of that. So I say, what you need is you need your nature healed. And only Jesus came to heal your nature. Any, anybody who, any religion that comes at you with a, a prophet and a law, it, it, you're going to break it. Now what? You're going to be forgiven. And then you're going to break it again, and you're going to forgive. It doesn't work. You need your nature healed. And that's kind of how I try to point them towards um, Jesus. Um, one or two more things. 
Muslims like me until they talk to me. Because, <laughs> because what they like is the kind of critique of the culture and the sin and all that stuff. And then they, then, they, then they come up and they try to talk about Muhammad and stuff. And I say, look, um, number one, how do you know Muhammad got a revelation? Um, it happened in secret. You don't know it. In my opinion, one of two things happened. He made it up or he got it from a demon. That's it. And at that point, I mean, you know, things go downhill a little bit. Although <laughs> some of them will come back and we get to know them and stuff. But, um, so finally, the Christians at Penn State. Um, and I, I, this is just a general statement. People get upset at me for making general statements. And I say, well, I, just, I just do that because these things, in my mind, are generally true. That a lot, that, well, they're kind of wimpy, basically, is what it comes down to. They, they've, and I have nothing against friendship evangelist, evangelism. I do that out there. I make friends out there um, with, with some of the students, and we talk and we get to know each other. They're focused on that to the extreme, so they believe that if people don't like you, you've done something wrong. That you're not evangelizing right unless because everybody loved Jesus, you know? And <laughs> so if you're doing it right, everybody's going to love you. Um, so they always come out, they've got a playbook, I'm convinced. Because they come, first they flatter you. Oh, I really admire your zeal and this and that. And finally I just said, look, stop flattering me, just get to the point. And the point is always uh, you don't love them because they get, they get blowback, right? They get, they get for, for a generation you know, like this, they get blowback, and they don't want that blowback. Um, so, I mean, as you know, I just try to point them to a lot of the times they try to kill Jesus. And even when, the, even when the crowds came, he said, look, you only like me for my miracles. Um, at times, they would all walk away, and he wouldn't run after them. Um, but again, it, it really doesn't matter. So that's kind of the state of Christianity there. It's, it's what I would consider kind of a false love. You, 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 you project a feeling to people. And I think it comes from their worship. You know, the kind of rock and roll worship where it's all about a feeling. It's all about how you feel. That, the music engenders a feeling, and that's the feeling of God, I guess. And the, the feeling of love, and then you project that feeling to others. And, you know, about, so, so the, those that are Christian, many of them are very weak. Um, and they're very influenced by the culture themselves. The desire for career it, it, it competes with their desire for God because the culture basically pushes you on this kind of pushes these kids on this. I know that they're in college, they're going to get a career, but it makes it this, the thing. And it competes with them. 